Hi, I'm Mark Dias, <clears throat> and welcome to what is going to be another vlog that'll probably upset somebody somewhere. But, uh, it's been, uh, bothering me for a little while, and, uh, last night I had a rough time sleeping just thinking about these kind of things. And, uh, basically what it comes down to is that a lot of times when I'm looking out just at the world or, you know, having a cigarette and watching people go by or listening to conversations or, you know, I've always been a very passive observer of the world. Um, like, I, a long time ago I had a conversation with someone that said that I would rather work minimalistically for the benefit of a lot of people than to work magnanimously only in the benefit for myself. And I guess, I mean, it's not intentionally a self-sacrificing thing, but it's something I do because, to me, I feel like it's the right thing to do, so to speak. And it's not so much a, a feel, I guess. It's more of a... When I work, or whenever I'm doing something, I feel that this could be helpful or beneficial, or... I'm doing something specifically for somebody, like I'm giving away a piece of myself for other people. Um, and a lot of times I can swallow down the normal frustrations I feel and put on a happy face and help someone get to where they need to go, whether it's, you know, finding something that's right for them or making sure that they're, whatever they're doing is worry-free. And I think that that goes strides farther in in just general people like yesterday I had to work and I hate working Sundays um, and the reason why I hate working Sundays is because uh, since I have a lot of people who aren't American there's this American thing where people will go to church and then they'll go to a store or go to a restaurant and they don't I don't know if they intentionally do it but they really treat people like dog shit and they come in and, like yesterday, I had a person who was like, hey, I need help. So I, like, walked over and talked to them, and then they were like, oh, yeah, oh, well, here it is, I'm looking right at it. And, you know, in general, like, felt stupid, because I, I pointed it right out to them. And then after, proceeded to talk to, like, say, like, oh, you know, God bless you, oh, here's a thing for our church. It's like, first off, if I'm working on a Sunday, what makes you think I have time to go to your church? Second off, under what guise do you think that I'd be at all interested in your church? Like, you're just, you're soliciting me after you were rude to me. Why would I want to be a part of something like that if you were rude to me? And it's like, I'm working you're not like it, it it for me like i i'd want to be like you know are you a complete jackass like do you have no common decency in this world like you are disgusting and but i can't i'm at work and i feel that even though i don't like them i'd rather them feel happy about whatever they did and then just walk away and that makes their day better because i've been in situations where I've been in a store and someone does something that's really dick and I feel terrible for the rest of the day because I'm like, it's like gnawing at me and bothering me. But I have people that I work with and that I have worked with who can't restrain that. They say things or do rude things outright and I have to correct them. And it's really strange to me that I guess viewing people as a whole and knowing what people would want or what would make me feel better, putting people in another person's shoes would make sense and therefore I can kind of co-relate with people. And I usually, like in a conversation, don't find a lot to relate to a lot of people. Like, if there's a conversation that's awkward, I try to meet my way out of it and be like, uh, yeah, let's talk about something else. Or I'll just, uh-huh, yep, uh-huh. Because I, I don't want to be like, look, your conversation sucks. I don't 
I don't really care about your kids or your dogs or whatever else you have to tell me. Like, this is, this is not even that it's trivial information. It's information that is just going to waste space in my brain in the long run. But I, like, all my life I've always had to kind of block off how I feel from the rest of the world. And that's important because as a society we have to say, like, look, these emotions aren't okay. You can't do this. You can't say this. And I know this all sounds like common sense to a lot of people, but <clears throat> even passively I try to avoid it. And there are some people that I go out of my way to piss off intentionally to provoke emotional response in people because I think that there's something in me that just wants to provoke an intentional response in someone so that, that way they can get over it. Like uh, a long time ago I had a friend who was very immature and would like suck her thumb and act childish and throw temper tantrums and fits and I was like I was just like, look, bitch, you need to grow the fuck up because no one is going to give a shit about what your little problems are in the future. When you get older, nobody is going to care if you just don't feel like going to work today. Like, nobody is going to care if you just, you don't feel like doing something right now. Like, nobody is going to care. You're going to have to pick yourself up and do that shit yourself and grow the fuck up. And... It's. I was saying it to be intentionally mean, and in many ways I don't necessarily mean it, because trust me, you can slack off all you want when you're adult, you'll just be dirty, and you, you know, might not have a great life. But, uh... <clears throat> so, she actually took it to heart after she threw a temper tantrum, and ended up being much better, but then years down the road she flipped a ten temper tantrum on someone and basically, like, ruined her life and someone else's life in the process. And, again, it was all because of a poor set of emotional responses. And I have another friend who works in law enforcement, and he brought up an article about uh, police officer abuses, because, I mean, he's a police officer, that's something important to him, and I, d I don't in any way hate police as a whole, or as a group, or as an entity. I just understand that there are people who are doing a job to fulfill laws that are made by people who have, like, fourth grade educations. So, that's understandable. Like, they, they just, they're just there to enforce the laws. You know, a lot of people think that police are out to get them and all this. It's like, well, if you're not doing something wrong, they're not really out to get you. And if you're doing something that's considered wrong then do something to change the law so you can enjoy a normal, safe, happy life and you won't have to worry about the police. Like, I always find it funny when, you know, people who are like... <sighs> well, I won't say people. I'll, I'll use a direct example. I had a friend a long time ago who sold cocaine. And he sold it a lot. I mean, he would... Mm, what the hell? Ugh. Um... Sorry about that. I had something to eat earlier, and a bit of a seed came up, and I thought it was a piece of my tooth. But anyway, um, and he was always like, oh, fuck the police, blah, 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 they're always out to get me, and whatever, and it's like, that's because you're selling cocaine, you have illegal firearms in your house, like, of course the police want to get you. Like, you, you are the problem. Like, you just don't recognize that you're the problem. And, uh, he got caught, but got off on a technicality for shooting someone. And, uh... So, yeah. I mean, that's that's a whole other issue. But my friend who's a police officer brought up an article about how police are people. And sometimes, you know, the stress of the day, the those kind of things that happen, like... The fact that a lot of times their job is a really thankless job. I mean, if you worked pulling people over all the time, you'd really begin to, like, hate your life unless you really enjoyed other people's misery, which I admit sometimes I do. But, you know, the people yelling at you, cursing at you, calling you names all day, even though that they were wrong in the first place, they just don't 
like once they get caught, their first reaction is to blame you, <clears throat> would set apart. And then he, they talk about like abuses and police officers that do things like crimes of passion or you know things like that. These things happen, you know. I mean, uh, and to blame like the police as a whole is a generally wrong thing. <clears throat> but I said to him, I said, you know, it's it. I'm sure it's hard to temper your emotional responses. I mean, you guys are out there fighting against people who can't <clears throat> control their emotions. People who get angry because their boyfriend cheated and then commit a double homicide. Like, people who, you know, get drunk and don't like the fact that someone's, a, like, not an Eagles fan and is instead, like, a Steelers fan and starts a fight outside. You know, uh, people who, you know, feel that they should be, you know, given a special treatment and therefore should get something for free and end up just stealing it. You know, these kind of emotions are really destructive in the long run, and police are there to meet that gap. There are people who are just too emotionally unstable, you know, that are just violent constantly because they can't control that drive, that urge, that emotion. When I was younger, I was really angry, and so was my cousin, and we both took it upon ourselves to not lash out and to not commit violence on other people, you know? I mean, I won't say that I was, like, a bully when I was younger. I was picked on quite a lot, but at the same time, everybody always has someone else that they pick on further on down the line. I mean, there is always the person at the very bottom of the chain, which it's... I, I mean, your kids, you're... It's not okay to do, but at the same time, it's just human nature, so it makes it very difficult and complex. But with those kind of things, you have to learn to control your emotions, because then, like, I started seeing that down the line, there would be trouble, there would be problems. Like, if I let my emotions rule me, I wouldn't be able to function properly, that it would cause more problems, and I couldn't live or do the things that I wanted to do in the long run. In some ways, you could say that that kind of foresight is lost on a lot of people. But I think, as a whole, that emotions are a severe, severe problem. Like, I, metaphorically, I think that saying that the tree of knowledge was, you know, the thing that ruined everything, um, according to, or ruined everything in the Garden of Eden, I really think that what they should have said is they ate the you know they ate from the the tree of emotion and they were carried off by it and that shows very clearly in human history i mean some of the the worst things have been put out by by emotions in general and i'm not saying that you should just become like oblivious to emotions or that you should be like equilibrium where nobody has any emotions although I do admit it would make society function a whole lot better um, there'd just be no creativity and uh, further into like emotional gaps and gulfs with people is is I find it amazing people's ability to emotionally connect with animals to the point where human beings become so denigrated to them and so alienated to them that they prefer time with their pet and that they prefer causes that benefit their animals over the welfare of other human beings because they think human beings are despicable because a few do things to animals that are horrible. But they draw this emotional response and suddenly they become like vegans and vegetarians and do all these other things and they then they justify it by saying it's a belief and saying that this belief is you know important and then draw back another emotional response even though rationality would say otherwise but it's strange that they don't realize like the repercussions of their actions that certain things emotionally you can't just you you can't just become so black and white about things that like this is animal cruelty this is not animal cruelty this is the, like there there are things 
that you need to emotionally let go of. And it's not that it's society or you should choose what's right and what's wrong for yourself. It's more a uh, you should look at things realistically, understand the things that won't change no matter how you feel about them, and then move on or work towards a progress. Like, I'm really sick of Facebook posts that are like, oh my god, look at these animal mistreatments and stuff like that. And then on the other hand, I have friends who are like, you know, does anybody want to help rescue this dog? And one of these is the right approach, and one of these is the wrong approach. Like, when you say, oh my god, all these terrible things are happening, flaming monkeys are raining from the sky, this is the most terrible thing ever because some dogs get abused, we've got to, you know, shave and sterilize every human being to help save these dogs, you're not really putting a good message out. If you say, like, a, some of my other friends do, is saying, I work for this animal shelter, we've got this lovely sweet dog, you know, would you like to adopt him? And the funny part is, is that the person that does that, which I, I'm not going to name any names or anything in case anybody from my Facebook sees this, but that person who talks about rescuing animals is also the same one that euthanizes them. And a lot of people would say, like, that's wrong, you shouldn't euthanize animals. It's like, then what are you going to do with half a million animals that can't be pets? What are you going to do with them? How are you going to pay to feed them? How are you going to do all this stuff? And there's this amazing gap of logic where they just say, all the animals should be loved. They shouldn't be put down. You know, we should just lock them away in a prison forever and pay to feed them. And that's not an appropriate answer. That's, that's just an emotional response that you can't say that something doesn't fit and we have no way of fixing it so let's just put it away somewhere, but it doesn't have to come to harm. And that's just weird. Like, I think that's more cruel to have an animal locked away forever just because you can't have a person in the room. I would think it would almost be better to euthanize that animal than move, move on. Or euthanize that animal and just move on. Um, and the only difference between humans and animals is that like I'm anti and pro death penalty when it comes to those kind of things because I have a lot of friends who post about this and when it comes to euthanizing animals or euthanizing humans and another conversation that recently sparked up about um, cropping dogs tails um, or cropping the, or cropping their ears or um, tails and things like that um, a lot of people just jump to... Well, I've had two people now that have posted to jump to ban it. But then at the same time, they're pro things like circumcision. So it's like, it's okay to mutilate a person, but it's not okay to mutilate a dog. Like, I don't understand where your logic works here. And then they're like, you're just being inflammatory. And it's like, no, I'm really trying to understand why you think it's perfectly okay to give an unwilling human being who will later have a choice and be aware of consequences and repercussions versus a dog that won't really understand consequence or re repercussions in this manner. They won't understand the difference between having ears cropped and not having ears cropped. They won't, they won't really put that in their mind, being like, boy, I really wish I had some fucking ears. Um, or the tips of my ears. And they just want to jump to ban it, and then I say, well, what about the people who, or what about the, the dogs that have, you know, infections in their tails, or have their ears scratched to tatters and they constantly get infected, or have constant irritation, and they, they need to be done. And they're like, oh, well, that's not cropping, that's amputation. It's like, no, it's still the same thing, it's still considered the same surgery, you're just changing the words in hopes that it's something different. If you put out a law, I'm sure there'd be more than enough people that would have their hands tied about this issue. So why, like, you know, it would, to put it simply, someone I know 
had their had a dog that they rescued, and they work in a, a vet's lab, uh, or uh, work at a lab for a shelter. Or Jesus Christ, they work in a vet in. I don't even know how to say it now. I've just completely. Well, either way, they work for a shelter that has like a clinic, yeah, a clinic for animals, and they rescued a pit bull, and. It was used as a bait dog, and it's had a, had to have a lot of surgeries, and had to have pins put in its arm, and it cost quite a lot for them to rehabilitate this animal. But it's so sweet; it's like the sweetest dog in the world. But the dog had previous breaks in its tail, and started banging its tail on things, and kept getting infections and irritations, and would chew away at its tail when it was hurt, and keep chewing at it, and keep chewing at it, and keep chewing at it. The problem inherent is that if you had banned, like, bobbing, cropping of, of tails, this dog, if you said, wouldn't be able to, to get its tail cropped, even though it's an important thing. And they said, oh, well, there are emergencies that you can use it for. Well, this dog didn't have an emergency with it. It was all treatable things, but they'd have to go every month or so to get it done then you worry about the vets who have their hands tied and can't do the bobbing or cropping to help as a preventative measure from this animal getting hurt uh, later down the line. And it's like, would you prefer that animal to suffer because it has this condition, or would you rather do something to fix it? But, of course, when it comes to answers like that, it'll always be like, that's a one in a million, it would never happen, oh, I think you're lying, oh, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, okay, look, like I'm trying to ask you a realistic question. If you're going to ban something, you have to be absolutely sure that you're ready to deal with the consequences, and that the consequences are not as heavy as, you know, the the pros of banning it. Like, the problem that they always seem to miss, that this person in general seems to miss, is that animals... And people ha will always have problems and complications. There are people in dog fighting rings. There are people of, um, especially, uh, I'm not saying this is a terrible thing, but it is very true. There are a lot of illegal immigrants that have set up their own medical, dental, and even pet clinics because they can't go to a legitimate place or can't afford or don't speak the language and don't know how to communicate. Um, or don't have their dogs registered, things like that. And I'm not saying hate against illegal immigrants, I'm just saying that there are these underground clinics. And there are a lot of people who bob and crop their animals in this fashion. Like, there was a whole episode on Animal Police about people who underground bob and crop ears. And how dogs get permanently maimed, lose their whole ear, have all these problems because they had these underground bob and crop because people think it's okay or like oh well we can just sedate the animal and then just cut off their ears and then put some bandage on them and they'll be okay not really understanding the, f the full complexity of the surgical process so yeah <clears throat> banning it won't stop these people in fact it will open up a whole new area of people in cities that have pets and things like that who want it Furthermore, once you ban it in this country, if you ban it in America, I know it's banned in, in other countries, but once you ban it in America, people will just go to take their pets to other countries to have the surgeries done. Groups like the American Kennel Club <clears throat> and stuff like that are still proponents of things like bobbing and cropping for show dogs, and a lot of breeders do it. There's a big issue with that because they're kind of the majority of people who do it and the majority of people who would have these surgeries done. So by saying banning it, it won't stop these people from doing it. They'll find some legal loophole, they'll they'll go out of the country to do it. It will just shift the paradigm. Um or even but for the common people, they'll go to underground clinics if they really want their dog's ears bobbed or cropped. So, you're actually creating more harm over the long run, more harm and stress to the animals, than you are if you...
basically made it fall out of fashion or found a way to reduce or restrict it only to certain licensed people or to but the jump to ban because you feel an emotional response is not the appropriate way to go about it it won't solve the problem it will make the problem inherently worse um and oh i didn't realize i have to go to work soon but uh ultimately what this boils down to is is that in society as a whole we have to stop jumping to emotional responses all these people who jump to causes without really understanding the full amount um the absolute nonsense with autism and vaccines which just needs to stop um there i have people on my facebook who i wish i could just block because that's what they talk about they talk about how vaccines are poisoning us or how some chemical in food and it's all this scare stuff and it's like dr like ed of you know the arizona institute of you know food sciences or like some really crock crappery thing and they don't look at source or like valid information because there's this huge gulf of information that's realistic and information that someone posts on a blog and people don't can't differentiate between them because a scientific paper might not provoke an emotional response in them or they just are too dumb to understand it and they they jumped to this idea that vaccines have to be poison and that you know if you eat a cheeseburger it's going to contain more lead than an rectal thermometer like i mean really when you look at a lot of actual facts about things there are scary things it's just that you don't understand them or people aren't posting them because they aren't sensational enough and the sensationalized media and the fear of invisible terrorists everywhere and all of this like fear and emotional pulls and like oh my god listen to the story about a seven-year-old who has cancer that's intractable and like I feel this fervor towards my candidate because he's certainly different from all the other candidates, even though they're all rotten. I mean, it it's amazing these jumps that people take to say that their emotional state is more important than fact. And it really is like a disease. And it's a it's a problem that needs to be discussed and figure it out a way to to sort through things and stop sensationalism because it really does hurt us all in the long run um another friend i had who i have the utmost respect for and she usually has the greatest opinions on things um and she has a, a more valid she left a more valid point but she a lot of people talk about global warming which i think global warming is more of a ridiculous thing than a simple climate change like the the earth has been getting warmer like let's just let's deal with that you can call it whatever you want but there are more natural factors um than unnatural factors really at play here and things we can't really understand um but you know there are these predictions about oh it's the same kind of predictions that I've been hearing for a long time, and it I, I don't say that it doesn't exist, but they're like, oh, it's been getting one degree hotter, and then from one degree it'll go to five degrees, and then we'll all roast alive by 2032. And it's like, when I in 1996, they put out a thing saying by 2010, the world would have so much CO2 that we'd all be dying. And now you're telling me it's going to be 2032? 2045 like this is just becoming apocalypse nonsense and so she posted an article that was a lot more feasible and saying that probably if we continued at this trend probably by the year 3000 or so you know earth would be completely devoid of life if human life continued to persist 
in the way that it's going now that we would be abs we would absolutely deplete this planet of all life, all resources, all viable things um, just because of our habits today. And that's it wasn't like 3000, it was like like by the year 2500 or something, we would be completely out of these things. And the one thing I'm a huge proponent of is getting off this planet and working towards space colonization and space travel. And it's not an emotional response for me. It's a, no, we won't have enough space to deal with people in two or three generations. I mean, it, everywhere in the world will be like India, like the crowded cities in India. Everywhere would be like that. And unless there's, you know, something catastrophic happens in between there we're going to have too many people. But once we move into space, it will allow Earth's population to relax and have a smaller and smaller population. And sure, we're going to have to dig quite a groove in the Earth to pull up enough to build ships to do the things that we need to do, and we'll need enough exotic matters. Um, but she talked about I said, you know, this is why space travel is so important. Fixing the environment is nice and all, but there's certain things we just can't change with this many people. There's certain things we can't change with the world as it, at its current state. We need to concentrate on moving large quantities of people into space safely, establishing new environments and biomes and habitats and colonizing new areas and planets and work really hard towards that. And th then the people that are left and the people in space can start bringing things to help this. I mean, once we work into space, we'll have to figure out a way to scrub CO2 from the air, a way to remanufacture CO2 as oxygen using you know, plant-based or something-based in order to safely recycle oxygen. Though both of those technologies could go leaps and bounds to help the CO2 problem that's currently going on on our planet. And not to mention the fact that we wouldn't need to strip mine anymore or mine out certain materials that we really need because they're f everywhere in space. Like, there's iron and all these amazing materials that are just floating in rocks in a big circle around our solar system, and they're completely untapped. I mean, think about a chunk of iron the size of Texas squared just floating out there, waiting to be tapped. And it's not a, a business thing, it's not anything like that. It's, why are we digging more holes in the Earth when would probably be more cost effective in the long run to strip down that one and bring it back to Earth or to keep it out in space. I mean, it doesn't make any sense why why we're still on this planet. We have the technology, we have the ability to do so. Nobody's willing to put up the money. And I said the the thing about fixing our environment, even if we fix our environment, we still have almost half the population that we need to fix, too. We have too many people, and there's too much going on on this planet right now, and too many people who are still starving to death to really focus on our environment when there's so many bigger issues out there. And she never puts things as an emotional response, which I've always respected, because we can have a civilized conversation that doesn't devolve into, you know like a emotional lashing but uh the way i think of earth is is that earth is inherently screwed as long as we're still stuck here and we're screwed because one meteorite one you know burst of gamma radiation our sun suddenly goes unstable like there's millions of things that could just end humanity permanently because we don't have the ability to survive outside of it. And survival 
is absolutely important. And if we're sitting here on this planet, wrecking our environment, worrying about whether it's okay or not to crop dogs' tails, instead of focusing on moving humanity forward, we're not going to get anywhere. And we're all just going to die, and we're, everyone's going to be clutching on to that last ideal instead of focusing on what we really, really, really need to do. And this emotional jump to emotional response is so frustrating for me because watching these people and we get so caught up in Earth and its causes and the things it needs when all along that's not the problem. The problem is is there are too many people here with too many opinions and we need to move out into space, stop having people starve to death, be able to survive beyond this because we're we're still hunter gatherers in a sense. We've just industrialized it. We're not spacefaring yet. We haven't taken that last leap. And even now today we're still pulling people out of the dark ages. And I know somebody's going to comment on the dark ages bit, but we're still pulling people out that you know think that women shouldn't be treated right, that you know like uh, animals are are just chattel and things like that we're we're still fighting through that that even then when we go into space these will these issues will still be there they're not going anywhere anytime soon but locking down things on earth instead of saying like who will do something about this they're saying how are you going to feel about this you know how can we change some words around as opposed to what can we physically do and I know a lot of people say the Facebook like thing, like, oh yeah, like this to help this cause, or the other day when I was woken up at like 7.30 in the morning by blasting music because people are running for some stupid cause, it's, it's almost backwards. And, you know, these are, these are things that maybe in the like 60s, 70s, and 80s would have been important to say, like, we need to get in the law. We need to step into this. We need to show them that we have rights, that this needs to really work. But that bureaucracy really won't last long when everybody's dead. And gripping this, this emotional need is almost insane and it really bothers me um, that everyone seems to be oblivious I mean my friend she said she wouldn't want to go into space because she doesn't even like airplanes she doesn't like things like that and that's understandable I'm not saying everybody just jump off the earth tomorrow I'm saying that people have to go like we have to get out of this planet we have to get out of this rut of countries and and singular governments and all of this nonsense because this nationalism and whatever isms you have are literally crippling humanity because we spend time and money doing these things instead of doing the important things that we need to do that we need to focus on that we as a whole as human beings need to put governments aside need to put our feelings aside and start working towards a larger humanity. And I think that talking to people leads me into this gulf where people are so er ignorant or arrogant to the idea that people need to move on, that, that we've already passed the space age and that we're just sitting around rotting. Um, until that until that really big gulf happens. And once we get into the space age, we'll unfortunately have the leftovers of the dark age, and we'll have the leftovers of this cause age, and we'll have the leftovers of all these other things, and all of these other problems to work out in the long run. But we won't be able to work out those problems unless we start working on the biggest problem, which is surviving. And every year that goes by it gets harder and harder 
for society to sustain itself as a whole. We have so many more people who, because of an emotional response, will spend the rest of their life in prison, even though they will never, ever be able to be integrated back into society because people think that they have a right to live. And there will be hundreds of animals that are kept and locked away and at a heavy burden to all of us, even though they will never be able to be given a home. And four cement wall or three cement walls and a chain link fence will be their life. Once we get out into space, you can go ahead and you can have a whole planet that's just a giant prison for these things, a place to put things away if you really want. You can have your hippy-dippy planet where all of you eat nuts and seeds and harvest everything organically because you have a population of, you know, a hundred thousand people that only eat vegan and all have pets that they just fall in love with, I'm sure that will last a long time. But saying that all of Earth should become that is such a delusion. And with the number of people we have, that kind of behavior is just intolerable. And to think that you, anyone has a right to tell anyone what they need to do to survive or what they should do to survive or to provoke an emotional response to get people to only eat organic grass-fed beef and all of this nonsense is just wasting space and it's just hurting us from from really getting to where we need to go. And the bigger picture and the ambition of the whole for the whole of humanity is something that I've always taken note of and I've not tried to drag my emotions into it when it comes to this and really looking out at the world I see these things and all I can do is passively watch them as people keep doing it over and over and over again and I think that the foresight and that the disconnection from emotions doesn't happen enough for us to really achieve something that would be important, something where people of ideals could have their own place. People who wanted things banned or wanted things a certain way would have their own place to do it, where, again, we'd all be separate but equal, and we could all just have enough space, room to grow, and we wouldn't be stuck here on this planet bickering, taking sides, making enemies, causing problems, building governments, building walls, doing all of these things that aren't helping us move forward. And really, that's all I have to say about that. I just... And I figured I'd put Wilfred up because it's a perfect example of how people get so caught up in small emotional things as opposed to looking at the larger picture. If you haven't seen Wilfred, you should probably check it out. It's actually one of my favorite shows. Not because it's dark and twisted, but the fact that Elijah Wood's character sees an imaginary dog that he thinks talks to him and it's all about the mo uh, these kind of weird emotions and interconnected relationships with things and people and him hiding his delusions from other people but the overarching scope of the fact that he is fucking nuts is avoided and that to me is like a microcosm of the world that when you watch the show, you don't think about the fact that he's mentally ill. You're more interested in how they're going to interact than you are of the whole of the world. And, you know, I think today, if Carl Sagan was alive, uh, he'd probably be really upset. In fact, when I was asked recently, if you could bring anyone back, who would you bring? And I chose Carl Sagan. And I said, I'd really like him to see what we've done, how far we've moved from, you know, you know, his era, he imagined spaceships and all this stuff, and instead we have cell phones and Netflix, and that we've really nested ourselves in this planet, and that human interrelations are way more important than the bigger picture and the bigger scope and the deeper 
understanding of what else is out there. And truthfully, the the one thing that I've been going on a, a hope and a prayer is I always wish someday that, you know, something extraterrestrial would show up. Um, and that things would really start changing after that. Because whole scopes of things would would change drastically. Drastically. I think that, uh, I totally said drastically. I think that something magnanimous needs to happen in order for us to wake up. And America and isn't the only one to blame. There are tons of countries that are that are sleeping and tons of people who are too focused in with who texted who and somebody's Twitter to really focus on a a larger world and a larger larger scope of things that are happening. I think not as many people question what is the universe and what happens as opposed to people are like, what's going to happen next with the Kardashians? And as a whole, these kind of provocative emotions are not the thing that we need right now. And I think that us as a whole just needs to move on. But I'm pretty sure Carl Sagan would be upset if he were alive today. Um, him and Gene Roddenberry, yeah, those they'd, they'd probably be a little upset at the state of the world right now. And, uh, yep, that's pretty much all I have to say about that. And I'm going to be late for work, so take that, work. But thanks for listening to the vlog. Um, I always appreciate any comments. I'm sure there'll be more than enough people who'll be angry. Whatever. See you later.